Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to welcome you to the Alan Cox Memorial Lecture for 2001. This lecture is one of the Bowie Lecture Series, which was inaugurated in 1989 to commemorate the 50th presentation of the William Bowie Medal. Because Alan Cox himself was not a Bowie medalist, he was a Fleming medalist, but not a Bowie medalist, this series has had to be renewed every five years by the AGU Executive Committee. Uh, to avoid that in the future, because we think that a named lecture series is important for the health of our section, we petitioned to replace the Cox Lectures by a new series which will be named after Edward Bullard, who was a Bowie medalist in 1975, and that means we no longer need to reapply every five years for permission to continue the series. The first of the, Bowie, of the Bullard Lectures will be given next year in 2002. This then is the final Alan Cox Memorial Lecture, and it's a pleasure to introduce this year's speaker, Ken Hoffman. Ken did his BA in Physics and his Master's and Doctorate degrees in Geophysics all at the University of California in Berkeley, where his thesis advisor was John Verhoegen. There followed a postdoc at the University of Minnesota with Subir Banerjee, and in 1974, Ken joined the faculty of Cal Poly State University in San Luis Obispo, where he has spent his subsequent professional career. In this time, he's held visiting professorships or fellowships during sabbatical leaves at the, University, at the Australian National University in Canberra, at Victoria University in New Zealand, at the University of Paris, at the University of Geneva, and with my group at the ETH in Zurich. I wish I could have as many sabbatical leaves as that. <laughs> Ken was elected a fellow of AGU in 1992 and served the geomagnetism and paleomagnetism section from 1997 to 2000, first as president-elect and then as president of the section. From 1995 to 1999, he was chairman of Division I on internal fields of the International Association of Geomagnetism and Aeronomy, IAGA. Ken has many publications to his credit, which can be broadly divided into two groups. The first group concerns rock magnetic problems and ranges from mechanisms of self-reversal of thermoreminents and natural ilminohematites to the separation of multi-component NRMs. However, his special interest has always and consistently been in the transitional states of the geomagnetic field during polarity reversals, a process that is still unclear. It was his contributions to our understanding of Earth's reversing dynamo that were cited when Ken was elected as AGU Fellow. So it's my great pleasure to invite Ken now to deliver this Alan Cox lecture on paleomagnetic observations of reversals, the search for systematics. Ken? Thanks very much, Bill. Um, this is a photo of uh, Alan Cox in 1992. Uh, maybe we can get the lights out a little more here. Uh, it was at the a uh, graduation party for his first group of students, um, and uh, three of them, the three of them are there. There's uh, Chuck Denham and Rick Blakely, and between them just happens to be Bob Butler, who became fellow, a fellow of the AGU just last night. Um, in the 1988 introduction uh, to JGR's Cox Memorial issue, Shubir Banerjee best summarized uh, for me the essence of Alan Cox as a scientist. He wrote, any overall picture of Alan's approach to science or his research style is bound to be a personal one. I would venture to suggest that two major facets stand out above all others in such an overview. The first was his integrated and holistic approach to earth science expressing itself in his study of the geomagnetic field, its origin, and time variations based on research in many interrelated yet distinctly different areas of the field. The second was his daring, his daring shared by many, perhaps all eminently creative persons in the sciences and arts, which was to recognize 
a, co a coherent pattern from an apparent jumble of early observations, announce it publicly, and take the consequences. I'm really honored to give this the final talk of the uh, Cox Memorial issue. Or lecture series. Thank you. Well, uh, one of Alan's, um, I better lower this a little bit. One of Alan's um, pet interests, of course, was uh, geomagnetic reversals. And I want to start with this slide as a comparison of, yeah, of the sort of an, the evolution of the geomagnetic polarity time scale uh, over 30 years of time from a time when Alan Cox worked with Dick Dole and Brent Dalrymple and Ian McDougall worked on constructing it with, with his group. Uh, in 1968, this was the polarity time scale uh, uh, over the past 1.3 million years. And it turned out to be um, uh, consisting of three reversals, uh, the Brunus cron and the Matsuyama cron with the Jaramillo subcron uh, within the uh, late Matsuyama. But over the years, because of the uh, acquisition of some uh, really fine high deposition rate sediments in the oceans um, and the uh, precise dating by Argon 4039 of uh, lava flows that have um, acquired transitional directions, we now see a very different picture of how the geodynamo really works. And that is that it's really active. And even though we can only be sure of those same three reversals, there are a number of times when the uh, magnetic field had gone through some contortion where we could at least call it an event. Um, and sort of starting at the, in a sense, at the end of the talk here, I, I just want to point out this suggestion that Dave Govins made a couple of years ago uh, following the work on, on, uh, by Hollerbach and, and Jones and others about the importance of the inner core in stabilizing the outer core field. The inner core itself can't generate its own field, but it can acquire a field by diffusion, diffusion in and out from the outer core. And that diffusion time is longer than the, uh, the time of convection or overturning in the core fluid. And so it's really up to the inner core to say yes or no if there's going to be a full reversal. And that's the idea, and it's uh, so simple and apparently obvious um, that um, I think this might stick around as, as an explanation um, for why there are maybe 10, to, uh, 10 events, um, some of which we might call excursions, some of which we might call abortive reversals, to every full reversal. Now, as a paleomagnetist, the problem has always been, you know, how can we describe the Earth's magnetic field during reversals? Um, that doesn't really matter, actually. It's part of the problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and in, in, in a real way that helps us understand globally what actually happens down there in the outer core. In a sense, every time we're fortunate enough to find any kind of record at all that has any intermediate directions, it's really like this guy here on an island. You know, he's up above this uh, uh, yarn ball of uh, Glatzmeyer and Robert's flux, okay, and all he sees is what's happening at, at that one particular spot at that particular time um, while this um, reversal is taking place. And of course, that can't even happen because um, reversals don't take place over the lifespan of a person. We only have the paleomagnetic record. Um, and, and this is really the problem. We have, everything is really incomplete in, in terms of our knowledge about reversals because the data is incomplete. Uh, there is no such thing as a, as a full uh, vector um, 
a complete record of a reversal from any site. It's really impossible, but we can get close in one way or another depending on if we're working with sediments that uh, record the field very well or a, uh, a very active volcano that would spill out many um, uh, in a chronological order, some, some number of shot, uh, s snapshots of what the field was doing at the time. Well, I want to say a few words about paleo intensity during reversals, and then I want to move into um, the main focus, which is going to be paleo um, directions. Um, there is, you know, what can we really, you know, at what point are we willing to? Um, to bet our house that something is a certain way, you know, way during a reversal. Well, I would bet my house that during a transition, the in intensity of the geomagnetic field, at least during most of it, is much uh, uh, weaker than prior to the transition. And this is seen over and over and over again. We know this is the, this is the case. I think we can feel very confident and comfortable about that. There's also now an indication uh, from these records here and from others that in which paleo intensity uh, had been determined through the, the, the traditional Tellier Tellier technique on lava flows, um, that after the reversal, and we should see that for these first two sets of data, we're looking at a, a log plot of intensity, uh, the field becomes maybe very, very strong uh, following the reversal. And, considerably stronger than prior to the reversal. And this must be telling us something about the process in, in, in the core. Um, now, far more controversial, but uh, very exciting, is the possibility that not only does the field increase at a, the time of a reversal, but in some way the field decays along a kind of sawtooth pattern until it reaches some lower threshold um, uh, when it's highly probable that an event or a reversal will be attempted. Um, the jury is certainly not back on this idea yet, but this, this record from the Pacific, uh, Pacific Marine Corps that shows for a number of reversals this pattern um, is, is, is very impressive, and yet it's also been shown that it's possibly an artifact of how the sediments had become magnetized. And so we, sh we need some more time to see if this is in fact the way it reversals work. If they work this way, then the idea of a reversal would be much more deterministic than we might have thought in the past. So, to directions. What we do in paleomagnetism because of the sparseness of the data sets, the, the few, um, re, you know, compared to other geophysical uh, disciplines, the very few data sets that we have of, of reversals and the incompleteness, we have to um, consider the data and compare the data in ways that um, are unique uh, to geophysics. And one thing that has always been done is to look at what we call the VGP path, um, which comes from looking at the chronology of the directional changes from one polarity to the other. And the, the VGP, or the virtual geomagnetic pole, is the, in this case, the North Pole associated with a hypothetical geocentric dipole that would have provided the direction seen at the time of, let's say, the cooling of the lava. And um, we follow this pole from one polarity to the other, and that is one of our main ways of comparing data from one uh, paleomagnetic data set to the other. And I just need to point out that it, it seldom happens, but you can uh, um, consider the south geomagnetic pole, um, uh, the, the south VGP, um, which would be antipodal to whatever you see here in the north of uh, VGP. Now, what can we learn from uh, comparing these, um, these uh, VGP paths? Well, one possibility is in, in the extreme case that during two back-to-back -back reversals, one from normal to reverse, let's say, and the next from reverse to normal, 
that the process in the core is exactly the same. Now, one thing we know for certain from, from theory is that the core fluid is blind to the sign of the field. So if this is the case, and if the process is exactly the same, what, however the path would, would be seen at a particular site during one reversal, it would be 180 degrees away during, during the next reversal. Now, the other po possibility is an extreme case is that that of actually where it was really Hillhouse and Cox that, that first proposed the idea of a standing field or a stationary field that might dominate and not reverse during one reversal to the next. And if that were the case, then as the rest of the field, primarily the, the dipole field, uh, would decay away in some manner, it would be that same field that would bias the direction at any site around the globe. And what you would see is more or less the same VGP path for both the normal to reverse and reverse to normal back-to-back -back reversals seen at, a particu at one particular site. So let's see what we can find in the paleomagnetic records about these kind of things. Well, we see both possibilities. Um, and I'll say right on the outset, I think that that may, may be explainable. Um, first, um, there's two sets of back-to-back -back reversals found on two islands in Hawaii. Uh, the first one was uh, set was uh, published by uh, Scott Bogue and Rob Coe. And the directional behavior of the reverse to normal followed by the normal to reverse uh, transitions is very similar. And much more recently, um, another set of, of data from uh, this one from Oahu, uh, published by Her Harold Bavera and, and Co. in 99, shows two paths here. First, the reverse to normal, one that comes up here. Uh, to Australasia moves over and for a number of flows um, you find the VGP in North Africa. The following reversal um, we see from normal to reverse the same situation. Not only that it goes through North Africa but there are a number of flows uh, that were extruded during a long enough time for there to be several VGPs in approximately the same position. So that would be consistent with some kind of standing field for these back-to-back -back reversals. Well, that's seen then sometimes. On the other hand, here is this sequence of, of um, paths from the uh, <coughs> exposed sediments on Crete. And let's look at the bottom three. Um, in this case, the, from the reverse to normal, we're looking at the north geomagnetic pole. And from the next of the back-to-back -back reversals, normal to reverse, we're looking at the south geomagnetic pole and then back to the north geomagnetic pole again. And you can see how similar they are. What that means is, if we were looking at the north geomagnetic pole here for the, the one normal to reverse transition, it would be antipodal to the other two. And so that would be a situation where you could say that those three reversals uh, that came in succession were that the process in the core was somewhat similar during the time of those three reversals. And the only thing that was different was that the, the field lines in the core were in one sense or the other to begin with. Now, another thing we can do with the VGP is to consider uh, in the, in, if we can have uh, several records of a particular reversal from sites that, you know, about the globe, uh, we can learn a little something about the um, transitional field structure. Um, here, if we have a, a dipole-dominated transitional field, it really doesn't matter where your site is. You will uh, agree with other sites where the VGP is at any particular time during the transition. Uh, because the field, in fact, was dipolar, and the VGP for a perfect dipole would be right at the pole of the dipole, and there would be only one. Uh, so all, all the sites about the globe would show similar, very similar VGP paths. On the other hand, 
if the field was strongly non-dipolar during the transition, um, then to some degree, and maybe to a major degree, these paths would be uh, very different for different sites about the globe. And the first case of testing this actually was the paper by Hillhouse and Cox back in 1976, uh, where they tested the data from their uh, Lake Tacopa sediment record with the record of the, this is the last reversal uh, that was uh, determined in uh, the Bozo Peninsula of Japan, found them to be completely different um, uh, tracks of the VGP and came to the conclusion that the field was non-dipolar. Uh, there were problems, it turns out, rock magnetic problems uh, with the Tacopa record and it was done later by Valet and others. And, uh, the answer still seemed to be the same, and that is that, uh, the, that the VGP path for California here, Lake Tacopa, uh, during this last reversal, is not the same uh, in the same locality as what was seen for Japan. Now, in the 70s and moving into the 80s, there was an indication that the, that during a transition, that transitional fields brought about changes in the, in the vector, of the magnetic vector, that would either run more or less through the site of observation or opposite, over, over the top, so to speak, through a vertically upward direction. And uh, the data at the time from the, of the Matsuyama Brunus, the last reversal, uh, of which we started gaining more and more records, uh, the VGP paths were, as seen by Hillhouse and Cox, all over the globe. But if you were only to look at each site, at how the vector changed, you saw that in every case, the vector went from reverse to normal along a track that seemed to be pretty much running through a vertical plane. And that brought up the possibility then that during reversals, the field remained strongly axisymmetric with very little east-west behavior. And that also showed that there was a possibility, if that were true, that paleomagnetic data could distinguish different um, geometric um, constructs of a reversal in the core. For example, if a reversal started at the equator, you would see behavior uh, that would go downward, uh, the vector would move downward in the northern hemisphere and, and upward in the, in the southern hemisphere. Uh, but on the other hand, if the reversal started in the southern hemisphere and, uh, and, and continued northward, you would find that it would be downward everywhere. And so um, that brought on uh, more activity of trying to find more records, and especially in the southern hemisphere. However, as time went on and more and more records were found, it became clearer that this model that seemed to fit the data at hand um, uh, didn't look so good. And so as more and more data was found for this, the last reversal, more and more it looked like that you found the VGP paths in one of two places, either in somewhere near Australia and, and East Asia or uh, running through the Americas. And it was with regard to the last reversal, this, everything started changing about 1990 because a number of things happened at the same time. Um, Brad Clement looked at all the data that we had at that time uh, from the last reversal and, and um, uh, uh, just drew out a histogram of the longitudinal distribution of VGPs. What longitudes do you find them at? And there was this bimodal distribution, very clear, of one band running through the North and South America and another antipodal to that uh, that would run, uh, either have VGPs in East Asia or Western Australia primarily. Um, and then to just add some more interest to this kind of picture, well, first of all, uh, Brad saw that those particular bands were, were where you found those high uh, latitude flux patches in the core, a la uh, Bloxham and Gubbins. And so the, there was this possibility that we were starting to link what we see in today's magnetic field 
to uh, paleomagnetic data uh, from, in this case, uh, almost 800,000 years ago. And then a year after this, it turned out that uh, Kathy Constable showed that over the last five million years of data at that time, uh, full polarity data, uh, that the secular variation showed the virtual geomagnetic poles to also have a bimodal distribution rather similar to what was, what was found in the uh, reversal records. So things started flying, but actually they started flying a year before that. It's not often that um, paleomagnetism reaches the cover of nature, and I know many of you over the years now have seen this many times, but Carlo Lodge and others showed with a select group of, of sediment records that not only, uh, not only was the Matsuyama Brunus one that showed this kind of preference for two uh, antipodal bands for the VGPs to run, but also um, it was true for reversals going back at least, say, 10 million years or so. And this select group showed a number of EGPs running through the Americas and running down through, um, again, through East Asia and, uh, and uh, Western Australia. But even more importantly, in the background here, you see this blue. And this blue trend here was one of the earlier uh, seismic tomographic mappings of the lower mantle, showing in blue where uh, the seismic velocities were a little faster and perhaps indicating that the lower mantle a little cooler than the material around it. And so now there was this, this possibility that what we were seeing is the, the uh, mantle controlled uh, transitional field that would happen over and over again um, for millions of years. And it brought about, because of the um, significance of the result, if true, a flurry of work in rock magnetism, in st statistical analyses, and also working with lava flow data to, to either refute, refute or attempt to refute or confirm this picture of mantle control of the magnetic field during reversals. Um, and I just show over here quickly two um, uh, studies of lava flows, the first Prevost and Pamps in 1993, and then uh, by Jeff Love in 1998. And even those two came up with uh, two different conclusions because of the way um, uh, the two analyses were, were performed, one showing uh, a kind of a uh, shotgun of, of VGPs throughout the globe, and another one showing uh, some preference from the lava flow records as well as what was seen in the sediment records here of this preference of these two paths. Then another in a, a, what will be a series of, at worst, coincidences, um, Kathy Constable, in 1992, um, noting, as, as we most many of us know, that the axial dipole is uh, the, not only the strongest aspect of the field by far at the Earth's surface, but it's anomalously strong uh, at the core surface where it originates. And that the axial dipole might be something that we can that we can uh, sever from the rest of the field uh, because during a reversal, I mean, the, the definition of, a, of a one reverse state to the other really has to do with the sign of the axial dipole. So it has to go through zero. So what, what might happen if the axial dipole runs through zero and then increases in the opposite direction, leaving behind the rest of the field, which is often called the non-axial dipole field, but for reasons of ambiguity, I like to use the word without the axial dipole, but I don't like the word wad, so I decided to use the French, and it's the sans axial dipole field or the sad field. The sad field is the field of the Earth 
minus the axial dipole. And it's very similar to the idea of dipole and non-dipole fields. It's just that the equatorial dipole term uh, defected. Okay. So if you do that and you take the axial dipole away and, and increase it in the opposite sense, from most sites, from many sites around the globe, you get this preference from today's field of uh, the VGB path running through the Americas. And if this sad field was reversed, you would have a path that would run antipodal to it uh, through East Asia and um, West Australia. A coincidence? Uh, perhaps. Well, it's at least a coincidence. Now, at the same time, and actually quite before, I was looking a lot at lavas. And I was intrigued by a number of records. Um, two of those records that I was intrigued by were the one, first of all, by, by John Shaw in 1975, where he redid the, this uh, very detailed uh, record of a reverse to normal Pliocene transition uh, from Iceland, uh, where there were many flows showing uh, uh, a transitional VGP in approximately the same place in Australasia. And he applied his new technique of um, paleo intensity uh, and found that in this, in this region here, um, the, the field, even though it didn't change its orientation from having this virtual pole near the equator, uh, that the field intensity increased abruptly and then decreased again before it moved on. Now, in 10 years later, uh, another redo of, of, of the Steens Mountain reversal that started with work by Norm Watkins back in the early 60s uh, showed this, this uh, very interesting feature of what is called a rebound, where uh, the VGP from this reverse to normal transition in the Miocene uh, from flow to flow moves up to here for a, a few flows and then continues and attempts to reverse, but it doesn't settle into the nor normal polarity, but it re returns back to exactly the same spot. I mean, I, I found that uh, years ago to be rather remarkable, exactly the same spot. And at the same time, the intensity, the absolute intensity increased by a factor of four while being in that spot. Well, I think it was the time when I was in France at, uh, in Paris, Oops. and I was uh, on the, also on the thesis committee for Annick Chauvin, and she was showing me her data from her thesis of here three reversals from T Tahiti, from lavas on Tahiti. And I noticed that in all three cases, there was a clustering of a few flows that had the same VGP somewhere near Australia. For this event here, for the end of the Har Mio, or uh, yes, the end of the Har Mio of, of, of Subcron, and for the Matiama Brunus transition. And so I started looking in the literature for clusterings of VGPs from uh, lava flows and found that preferentially they were, they were found in, in two places in the southern hemisphere, uh, one here in the South Atlantic, another here uh, somewhat west of Australia, and that they, those two patches uh, of VGPs from a number of different uh, reversals happened to coincide with these preferred bands. So I, I looked at this sans axial dipole field um, and noted that, in fact, when you take away the axial dipole, you actually today see four foci of the most concentrated flux at the Earth's surface that looks something like this. And the red one here is a, of an opposite sign. This is an upward uh, directed flux, uh, and this is downward directed uh, both in the northern hemisphere in these two spots and also here uh, centered around the Falklands, let's say, which happens to be also 
um, a patch that um, uh, Jeremy Bloxham and, and Dave Govins have seen grow over the past 300 years because it has a sign that is different from uh, what you would expect in the southern hemisphere and has been taking part in the decay of the axial dipole of today's field. Well, it turned out the more I looked at the records, even the ones running through the preferred bands, that you could see that much of the time in the sediment records was spent with the field more or less in the same, in the, in the same orientation, the same uh, transitional state, and that there really isn't all that much information across the equator. Um, but in this case, we see a, a, a band here from this uh, very detailed record from Crete and then jumping up to uh, North America. And then from this record, um, from the North Atlantic, seeing also uh, those two uh, clusterings, but also it's a very complex record of the upper Olduvai. And you see uh, a time when the VGP was spent in Western Australia. Somewhat similar to seeing, uh, to what we see in today's modern day field. Again, perhaps just a coincidence. coincidence. We also see the same thing in uh, events uh, in the brooms, more, much more recent events. We see here um, VGP paths where this is again a, a reversal that didn't occur, um, but looks to me like an abortive attempt for sure, and that is a VGP that runs to that same spot and then just quickly moves over to Western Australia and returns up to normal polarity, maybe for psychological reasons, I don't know. But in any case, from T in Tahiti, um, Brad Singer earlier today gave, gave a talk where um, we, we had been working on this uh, particular sequence, uh, thinking for sure we were looking at the Matsuyama Brunus uh, boundary again from a second position on the island, where the first position by Nick Chauvin and others showed uh, this VGP patch. But, and we find this VGP patch, but this happens to be 200,000 years later. Uh, this is another event in the Brunus, the big lost event. And it shows a VGP path that moves down to virtually the same locality that what's, what was seen during the full reversal 200 years prior to that. Well, I want to say a few words now, again, about the Matiamo Brunus, bring it a little more up to date. I bring it up to date with this database that Jeff Love and Alain Mazod uh, put together back in 1997, where it really, I think, for the first time, uh, they took the time to, to attempt uh, to uh, apply certain criteria of, of reliability to the number of records now that are in the literature. I think something like 62 records. And only 11, the red stars, were found to actually have data that passed the tests. Well, when I contour the VGPs from these 11 sites uh, to see where we really find them most, this is what, what, what we find. Um, we find four lobes of, of these transitional VGPs, again, uh, virtually antipodal to one another. We see a sort of the Black Sea running through the equator. Any place that's black there has almost no VGPs at all from, from all these records. Uh, in fact, any spot that is in black means that within a circle of 30 degrees radius with that site at the center, there's no more than two VGPs found. So what I would say is from our best data now from the Matiano Brunus, we really can't say from this, what happens actually during the actual reversal where the VGP jumps from one, uh, the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere. But we can say, I think, that much of the time of the reversal is spent not with the VGP doing that, but with the VGP sitting in particular, uh, particular states or due to particularly long-lived states. And the most um, uh, dramatic one, because it's closest to the equator, 
is this one right here again in, in uh, west of Australia. We see more VGPs here from a number of the sites than in any other place. And I would suggest that this means that during this transition, much of the time of the transition was spent with the field in a state such that many of the sites around the globe had directions that would give VGPs in this particular position. In fact, from the mid-latitude sites, from lava flows, from sediments, from wind-blown loess from China, from uh, uh, lavas on, on, in Chile, and from the deep ocean, we see clusters of VGPs about that same spot um, uh, about Western Australia. So the question then to me was, well, can today's field, can we look at today's field and say anything more? Can we in any way simulate or, or the possibility of why we see what we see here during the Matsuyama Brunus? And so what I did was, was to reverse our field so that we can compare to the Matiyama Brunus, which is from reverse to normal, and to start removing the, the axial dipole field little by little until it was completely removed. And a long story short, you end up with VGPs that run up through a preferred band to the most probable site for today's field is that the, uh, off Western Australia, rather similar to what was seen during the last reversal. Now, the question is, is that a fluke? What can we say about the past? Well, we, so far, I, I haven't gone far enough, more than 100 years. But for the last 100 years, it looks pretty much the same. This is what the Sans axial dipole field looked like in the 2000, year 2000 field, 1950 and 1900. And I have contoured this so that it was, it's normalized to 100% of, of the strongest component of the transitional field. So wherever you see white, you see that that is at least 90% of the strongest vertical field seen uh, about the globe. Uh, during this time when the axial dipole is removed. And so the first thing I want to point out is that in 1900, uh, the, the, this, verti this normalized vertical component looked very different than what it looks like today. It means that all these components are not increasing at the same rate or they would all three of these plots would look the same. So there's the, all these changes are taking place. But interestingly, we find that the most, the, the most probable place for VGPs to have occurred if a reversal were to have occurred in 1900 and 1950 and, or the year 2000, in all three cases, is west of Australia. And so what I would say is, you know, it's a little early. I think we should try and, I should try and go back as far back in time with the best field models that we have back a few thousand years before we can be sure of this. Well, ne next question is, is the field, how dipolar is the field? Well, from all those VGPs clustering around Australia during the last reversal, it would seem that perhaps the field was very dipolar. But I don't think so. If you go to higher latitudes, like in, in at about 56 degrees latitude in North Atlantic, uh, there's these three uh, remarkable data sets of the last reversal that came from Channel and Lehman back in 1997. They s show only very minor behavior having anything to do with VGPs around Australia. What they do show, all three of them, and they're very similar, is back and forth behavior between the South Atlantic and uh, East Asia around uh, Siberia. And in fact, if you look at just that data for all three of these uh, uh, very similar records, um, only from, uh, as it goes back and forth between South Atlantic and, uh, and Asia, it looks something like this. 
that the field stops for some time in the South Atlantic and stops for some time in, um, in uh, Asia and is not anything like either what's seen at low to mid latitudes during this transition, nor is it along a preferred band. So what does it mean? I would suggest, and not to, to make any kind of a pun with the NSF, that there are fast lanes um, uh, for VGPs to move during transitions, uh, certainly the more recent transitions over the, maybe the past few million years, uh, between these foci of, of field that exist at a time when the axial dipole has, been, has decreased um, during a reversal. And that not only can they go through preferred bands like these, they can go back and forth <clears throat> in the southern hemisphere or in the northern hemisphere or in a sense kitty corner as we see here. Um, and then the question of course is, well, is there any you know, what, what, what are these foci? Where do they come from? Why are they there? Um, well, back in 1987, um, this particular um, tomographic view of P-wave velocity in, in the lower mantle would suggest that the, there are four places of very cold uh, or, or relatively cold lower mantle that correspond one-to-one -to, -one to these. Um, Later tomographic mo models don't seem to show it quite that well, but at the same time, there are places such that in Australia here, even for several of the models, where there is this cold patch of, of lower mantle material. And it seems that it is this lower mantle material that sits there maybe for you know, several tens of perhaps millions of years that locks in flux and, uh, can, and brings about recurring, long-lived uh, states of the, of the transitional field during reversals. So I'll just end here with this um, cartoon that is nothing but a story that comes from paleomagnetic data, and that is when we can look at the core as a holistic body where the inner core affects you know, whether there's going to be a reversal of the main field or not. And at the same time, if there is a, a field reversal, um, then at a time when the main field uh, decreases uh, and perhaps vanishes, what, is, what remains and what controls the transitional field would be uh, due to the mantle having control over the, uh, of the outer core near its surface. And in a sense then, transitions might be showing us a partial uh, sort of weather map of, of, the, um, of the shallow core. Thank you.